Hello, this is Kent Holland. This is a three-part uh, series on site safety for construction projects. We're going to deal with site safety from a project owner perspective, a design professional, a construction manager, and a contractor perspective. There are, each one of these modules is about 20 minutes long or so. If you combine three of these together, you'll have a one-hour program. Um, but I do encourage you to watch all three uh, because uh, together they give you a really good snapshot uh, overview of site safety responsibilities that might arise out of a contract or that might arise out of actions in the field. Let's begin now with the first module. Let's talk about owner responsibility for job site safety. Once the project owner has executed a contract with its independent contractor delegating site safety responsibility to that firm, the owner generally has no legal liability for injuries to the employees of the independent contractors unless the owner asserts some control <clears throat> over the means, methods, and procedures of the contractor's work or takes some action at the project that causes or contributes to an injury. There are exceptions to this general rule, including where uh, there's a non-delegable duty or uh, an inherently or intrinsically dangerous activity or negligent exercise or retention of control over the work by the owner. Merely retaining the right to stop, inspect, or approve work is generally not enough to create owner liability. Instead, retention of control by the owner must be so significant that the contractor cannot freely choose and exercise its means, methods, and procedures as it deems fit. In the case of Bell v. Telesis Construction, Inc., uh, a Pennsylvania 2011 case. A project owner, Lafayette College, entered into a construction management agreement with a general contractor to renovate a building. That firm in turn uh, subcontracted the renovation work to other contractors, one of whom performed the roofing work. An employee of the roofer climbed scaffolding that had been installed by a masonry sub and fell from the scaffolding, suffering a serious injury. The employee then sued the construction manager um, as well as the masonry subcontractor and the college, alleging that all of them were negligent. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania held that although the college exercised some authority regarding safety and regulated access to and use of certain areas of the premises, this conduct did not constitute the type of control that would be subject to liability, since it did not retain control over the actions of the independent contractors. So this uh, example of where the owner can have some limited uh, responsibility on the project, so long as it doesn't actually exercise control over its independent contractor, it removes itself from the liability for injuries to the employees of those contractors. The general rule is that employees of an independent contractor that are injured in the workplace cannot sue uh, the party that hired the contractor, their boss. In other words, they can't sue the owner of the project that hired the contractor for whom they work. And this is true even when the party that hired the contractor failed to comply with the statutorily imposed workplace safety requirements, so long as it didn't affirmatively contribute to the accident. U.S. Air hired an independent contractor to maintain a luggage conveyor at the San Francisco airport. It did not direct the work or have its own employees participate in the work. The conveyor lacked safety rails or safety guards. And while inspecting the conveyor, one of the contractor's employees got his arm caught in it. 
after workers' comp insurance insurance paid, he then sued U.S. Air, claiming that the airline caused the injury. The court held summary judgment was properly granted to U.S. Air because it was permitted to delegate the contractor its duty, if any, to ensure workplace safety. This is a case of Seabright Insurance versus U.S. Air. Very important decision in showing the extent to which um, a project owner can delegate to an independent uh, contractor site safety responsibility. And this is one of the reasons you'll see in the contract that it will routinely say that a contractor is an independent contractor, is not an employee, not an agent of the project owners, just an independent contractor. And that creates this, uh, this standard that we see in this case here. Um, in this case, California case precedent was cited by the court that establishes that the hirer of an independent contractor, quote, presumably delegates to that contractor its tort law duty to provide a safe place uh, or a safe workplace for the contractor's employees, close quote. And the court says that U.S. Air owed its own employees a duty to provide a safe workplace and could not delegate that duty to the independent contractor. But that duty does not extend to the contractor's employees. Now, the logic for the holding was explained as follows. Quote, in light of the limitation that workers' comp places on independent contractor's liability, it would be unfair to permit the injured employee to obtain full tort damages from the hirer of the independent contractor. This inequity would be even greater when the independent contractor had sole control over the means of performing the work." Close quote. The next case involves an employee that was injured in a trench collapse and the court held that uh, he couldn't circumvent the workers' comp statute by suing his employer uh, absent uh, evidence that there was a, an intentional wrong that created substantial certainty of injury. In this case, an employee was injured when a trench collapsed. It was an unsured trench, 25 feet deep. He sued his employer, arguing that um, the, quote, intentional wrong, close quote, exception to the workers' compensation statute um, was um, an exception to the prohibition against filing suit against the employer. And the court found that the contractor did act with poor judgment and that was he was guilty of an exceptional wrong, but that that wrong was not, quote, intentional. And the court said there has to be a showing of actual intent to create a wrong and substantial certainty that the wrong would lead to injury or death of the employee. Now here, OSHA did an investigation and found that the non-compliance was, an ac was uh, not an accident or negligence, but rather was what they call a, quote, willful violation, close quote, of OSHA standards. But OSHA's willful violation does not necessarily constitute a willful violation under the workers' compensation law. And that's what the court made clear here was that this injured worker would have actually had to show that there's almost a malice, there was an intent to harm the employer or employee through this wrongful conduct and had failed to do so. This is a case of Van Dunk versus Rexon Associates. What I'm, I have a slide here that you should be able to read. I'm just quoting from the court's decision. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, if you want to read it, you may. In the little picture I'm putting up here, I've, you know, it's uh, sad, you know, after that case we just saw where an injured worker takes place, but this is a, an unsured trench, and it looks like there's a huge boulder propped up on a couple of sticks while the worker works under it. Let's look now at the issue of design professional responsibility for site safety. Design professionals and professional consultants also need to take precautions against accepting responsibility 
for the safety of anyone other than their own employees. Numerous court decisions have addressed the question of whether a firm, such as an architect, engineer, or CM, has liability for someone else's employee despite not being directly or even indirectly responsible for causing the injuries. And that's what we've been talking about so far with owner suits, uh, contractor suits, all involving subcontractor employees. Now let's focus on designers. And the first question addressed by courts is whether the contract between the design professional or consultant and its project owner client established uh, uh, responsibility, site safety responsibilities for that designer. Even if the contract language clearly states that the consultant has no responsibility for project safety uh, and the contractor is solely responsible, uh, the court will not stop there with its analysis. Rather, the, the courts will look at all the facts of the case to determine whether the consultant did anything or should have done anything in the field during construction that affects site safety. So the first stop is you look at the contract, and a good example would be the AIA B101 2007 edition at Article 3.6.1.2, uh, and also uh, the AIA 201 uh, 2007 edition at Article 11.1.4, and both of those say that the designer is not responsible for site safety, that the contractor has that responsibility. So we're going to be looking at some contract clauses here that focus on uh, good contract language to specify the lack of responsibility by contract for site safety of others' employees by the design professional. But the next issue then becomes, so you have a good contract, but the court will look beyond what the contract says to determine what happened in the field to see whether the design professional insinuated itself into design safety responsibilities. And we'll be talking about that as we go forward. The first thing we look at is the contract of the design professional or the contractor. The design professional contract with the owner should expressly state the limitations on the design professional's role concerning job site safety responsibility in field uh, activities must mirror whatever those limitations are in the contract in order for the design professional not to be tagged with uh, site safety responsibility despite the fact that it had a contract saying to the contrary. If we look at the Engineers Joint Contract Documents uh, Committee, the approach that the E500 contract states uh, is uh, quoted here on this slide. I'll just read it uh, very briefly. The engineer shall not be responsible for the acts or omissions of any contractor, subcontractor, or supplier, or other individuals or entities performing or furnishing any of the work for safety or security at the site, or for safety precautions and programs incident to the contractor's work during the construction phase or otherwise. Engineer shall not be responsible for the failure of any contractor to perform or furnish the work in accordance with the contract documents. Close quote. When a design professional uh, does site observation during the construction phase of performance, it sometimes uh, runs into the issue of uh, a contract that might use the word inspection, stating that the designer is going to inspect the work of the contractor. Well, instead, uh, the design professionals, attorneys, and risk managers are going to advise them, don't agree to, quote, inspect, but rather you will observe, monitor, or review the contractor's work. Now, the AIA B101 versus the consensus docs, this is something we need to consider. The, um, we're going to see cases as we go forward that show that the different states really interpret what is the responsibility of a design firm with regard to uh, site safety quite differently. Um, and under the consensus docs 240, there is language at Article 3.2.8.4 that states, quote, if the architect engineer has actual knowledge of safety violations, the architect engineer shall give prompt written notice to the owner, close quote. Now, that provision, I believe, would effectively uh, apply the strictest standard of the state saying that if an architect you know has knowledge of an imminent danger then it has to report that to its client 
um, whereas certain states would not require that. So be aware of that clause. Uh, you may want to consider striking that from the, uh, the contract. So in general, with regard to contracts, my recommendation is affirmatively state in the contract that the design professional is not responsible for the safety programs and procedures of the general contractor or for the overall project site. Rather, the design professional is going to be responsible for its own services being performed safely. It's going to be responsible for its own employees and, of course, responsible for uh, maintaining its services in a way that someone doesn't walk onto the site while it's performing and, and be injured as a result. So, having a good contract, it becomes very important to be careful what you do in the field so that, as a design firm, you don't insinuate yourself into site safety responsibilities. So the question is, when is a consultant going to be liable thir for third-party injuries on a construction project? The courts, again, they first look at the contract to see if it imposes any duty or if it might even contain language that expressly either says you're going to do um, site safety or perhaps it expressly says you have no site safety responsibility. But even if the contract does um, have clauses saying you will not be responsible for site safety, it is pretty easy for the consultant to still get tagged with liability based on what the consultant does in the field. First example I'm going to put up is a case called Carvalho versus Toll Brothers, 1995 decision out of New Jersey. And this case held that an engineer was liable for workers, uh, a worker's death in a trench collapse. And in this case, the resident engineer that was on that project doing site observation had observed this unshored trench in the sandy soils of New Jersey and didn't do anything about it, figured that it had no duty. Well, when the litigation got started, a deposition asked the engineer, did you know about this? And he said, yes, I knew about it, but it wasn't my duty to do anything. And the New Jersey court said, yes, it is. Engineer in New Jersey that has knowledge of an imminent danger has a duty because it's right out of the National Society of Professional Engineers, um, incorporated by reference usually into state licensing uh, law for design professionals, that the duty to health, safety, and welfare could trump the contract. And that's what New Jersey held here. Now, in sharp contrast to that, right next door in Pennsylvania in 2001, the court in a case called Hersog versus Hampton Township looked at very similar facts where another laborer died in a trench collapse. And this time, the general rule, according to the Pennsylvania court, was that the consultant's basic duty is to see that his employer gets a finished product which is structurally sound and that conforms to the specifications and standards. Now notice that that decision is consistent with the contract language that we cited earlier that explains the role of the architect during site observation. And the court went on to say, quote, any duty that the consultant may have involving safety procedures of the contract must have been specifically assumed by the contract or must have arisen by actions outside the contract, period, close quote. And then finally the court said, quote, in determining whether the consultant's contractual duty to supervise the construction includes the safety practices on the job site, the AE may intentionally or impliedly by his actions bring the responsibility for safety within his duty of supervision." Close quote. So what this case tells us is that the AE does not have responsibility for site safety unless its contract says so or if it does something in the field to make it so. But in Pennsylvania, even though the design firm has knowledge of an imminent danger, no responsibility to that, uh, that uh, laborer. Rather, the responsibility is only to the engineer's client. Um, and so, no liability for site safety in this instance. Now, the factors that the court in Herzog and other courts have looked at in determining whether to impose liability on a design professional are the following. In talking about site safety, one of the things I really emphasize is the importance of 
discussing this with attorneys in your particular state familiar with the laws concerning site safety. It really varies a lot from state to state. This has been just a, a general educational uh, presentation for general risk management purposes to give you uh, some oversight, um, an overview of the whole issue, but it is by no means legal advice and I really uh, encourage you to seek legal advice uh, in your particular state on all of these issues. My contact information is on the last slide that I'll put up at the end of this uh, program today with uh, my email, my phone number, etc. Again, I'm Kent Holland with Construction Risk LLC and I appreciate the time that you've spent uh, with me today.